And welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Accurately Measuring Mouse Urinary Voiding Frequency and Volume Using the Eurovoid System. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and it is my pleasure to be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by MedAssociates Incorporated and will focus on new technology and associated methods for non-invasive measurement of rodent urinary voiding frequency and volume. First, we will be joined briefly by Jerry Herrera, President and Principal Scientist at Catamount Research and Development and Vice President of Research and Development at MedAssociates, located in St. Albans, Vermont. Dr. Herrera obtained his PhD in Molecular Physio Physiology and Biophysics from the University of Vermont in 2001, where he studied smooth muscle excitation contraction coupling. He is an expert in muscle physiology, specializing in the smooth muscle that lines hollow organs. Dr. Herrera is currently an adjunct assistant professor in pharmacology at UVM and maintains active research collaborations with academic colleagues. His research interests include the physiology and pathophysiology of the urinary bladder, smooth muscle excitation contraction coupling, electrophysiology of smooth muscle cells, cellular calcium signal transduction pathways, and integrative physiology. Today, Dr. Herrera will provide a brief introduction to the history of studying voiding frequency in rodents, including a review of challenges that scientists face when attempting to accurately track micturition in rodents. He will also provide a brief product overview of the new Eurovoid system. Following, we will be joined by Nathan Taikaki, Research Assistant Professor at the University of Vermont Lerner College of Medicine. Dr. Taikaki's foci are pharmacology and physiology of smooth muscle from the signal, single channel level all the way through to the whole animal. His research explores the roles of ion channels as signaling regulators in the urinary bladder urethelium to trusser muscle, vasculature, and sensory nerves. Ultimately, his studies aim to uncover mechanisms responsible for bladder dysfunction that develop with stress and aging or with disease progression, specifically diabetes and hypertension. Today, Dr. Taikaki will discuss the technical challenges involved with measuring urine volume and frequency in the mouse. He will provide an overview of his experience using the Eurovoid system and will showcase recent data from his laboratory in which mouse voiding studies are providing valuable insights to, the, to disorders of the lower urinary tract. So again, uh, thank you, Andy, uh, and thank you all for joining us for today's session. Uh, I'm real happy to be with, uh, have you all here with us, and I'm excited about today's program, where we're going to be telling you about uh, our new system that we've developed uh, here at MedAssociates called uh, the Eurovoid system. And this system is specifically designed to measure urinary voiding behavior in mice. Uh, and we also have systems available for rats uh, which we can talk about uh, at the end if you have specific questions. Um, I want to start by telling you a little bit about my background and specifically how we developed the Eurovoid system. So I've been interested in animal models of bladder function since my PhD work uh, in Mark Nelson's lab at the University of Vermont. In the Nelson lab, I was uh, studying excitation contraction coupling in urinary bladder smooth muscle. And as a physiologist, I wanted to have a system where we could take the cellular and molecular phenomenon that we were interested in and apply them to hypotheses that we could test at the whole animal level. So we developed what we called the small animal systometry system. And this was actually the first product that I designed after joining MedAssociates to lead the R&D efforts. Um, the small animal systometry system is a very useful tool for providing detailed urodynamic assessment of lower urinary tract function in rodents. Uh, you can measure bladder pressure and non-voiding contractions during uh, controlled filling cycles. You can also get an index of intermicturition interval and voiding frequency. So it's a really powerful uh, tool uh, for studying lower urinary tract function, uh, but it does have limitations. Uh, specifically, it requires the surgical implantation of a catheter into the dome of the bladder. And that process can be associated with complications like post-surgical inflammation, uh, mechanical constraining the bladder just simply by having the object, um, the catheter itself, implanted. Um, and, and, and there's also some functional and applied challenges as well, like having the mouse chew through and bite the catheter and destroy the recording system. 
Uh, so we became interested in having a way to study voiding behavior in rodents in a non-invasive manner, something that could give us an idea of voiding behavior, but uh, without requiring implantation of a catheter. And uh, that's what led us to uh, eventually come up with a Eurovoid system. Some of the requirements that we were working towards with having such a non-invasive system for measuring bladder function in mice uh, were that we wanted to have a cage designed for the mouse to live in. So it was important that we wanted, we wanted to have a system where the we could study voiding behavior over long periods of time to get an idea of the normal voiding patterns in, in the animal. And so the cage has to be designed such that the mouse can live in it, uh, has to have adequate living space. Uh, in a similar manner, we need to be able to provide access to food and water to the animal. Um, and with the food and water access, we want to make sure that the food and water that uh, devices themselves do not contaminate measurements that we're trying to make of bladder function. So we need to contain any spillage so that they don't interfere with our measurement system. Um, we need to be able to separate feces from urine, uh, and this ends up being one of the most significant challenges in mice due to the small volumes of urine that are voided, uh, as well as the small size of fecal pellets. Um, so that's one of the most challenging requirements right there. Um, with regards to collecting the voided urine, it's very important to know the time that each voiding event happens, as well as the volume associated with that void. So that was really important to us to have a way to accurately track the time and the volume of each void event. So with that, we uh, have, first thing that comes to mind is metabolic cages. Uh, these are actually designed for separating feces and urine uh, from, from animal models. Um, and uh, it looks like several of you have tried using them as well as we have. Um, and many of you have found the same thing that we have, that they could cannot be used for accurately measuring voided urine uh, in the mouse. Uh, so that it's interesting that our poll shows the same thing that we found. We, we tested many of these devices that are on the market uh, and trying to find a metabolic cage that allows us to uh, accurately measure voided urine volumes in the mouse. And, uh, many of the cages do a really good job of separating the feces from the urine. Uh, some of them don't separate so well, uh, but really even if they separate the feces and the urine very well, um, the funnel devices that these systems have really uh, uh, suffer from one problem, and that's that too much of the voided urine volume remains trapped to or adherent to the funnel separator. So even if we can cleanly and clearly separate the feces from the urine, we still have too much urine that remains trapped to the collection system itself. And because we're talking about voided urine volumes of tens to a few hundred microliters in the mouse, uh, you know, that's, that's just a few drops of urine. Um, any loss uh, on the funnel means that we can't accurately measure the total void volume. And, and that really eliminated us from being able to use metabolic cages in, in a system to accurately measure voiding behavior in the mouse. So what we ended up with is what we call the Eurovoid system. And that's shown here. Um, you can see what we have is a cage. And the cage is designed so that it's large enough to accommodate uh, the living requirements uh, of a mouse, of a single mouse. Uh, it has adequate floor space and adequate uh, vertical height to allow rearing and free free behavior. Uh, we also have food and water devices to provide ad lib access to food and water. And these devices are designed so that any food or water spillage is contained within the receptacles themselves and does not make it out into the living cage. Because the floor of the cage is constructed with grid rods and the floor of the cage allows solid feces and liquid urine waste from the animal to pass beneath the floor. So we want to contain any food and water and prevent it from spilling out um, so that the only thing passing through the cage floor is feces and urine. Now beneath the cage floor, that's where we've located our filtration device and it's a mechanical filter. I'll show you a closer picture here in a moment, um, but this filter is designed to trap fecal pellets while allowing uh, the urine drops to pass freely through. And the urine, once it passes through this filtration device, lands on a pan which uh, sits on an analytical balance where we can weigh the voided urine volume. 
So the Eurovoid system allows for chronic, non-invasive measurements of voiding behavior in mice. Uh, these recordings can last up to 40 days with our recording software. Uh, so it's plenty of time to get really good measures of, of uh, normal, uh, spontaneous voiding behavior. Uh, in a, along the lines of experimental throughput, you can monitor up to 12 mice from a single computer. So it's really good for studying whole, whole entire cohorts, cohorts of animals at a single time. So uh, this is an example of what the data looks like. Uh, we call this recording avoiding micturogram, and this is the signal from the analytical balance. And what you see is every time the animal voids, uh, we detect uh, a mass on the scale, and the scale signal increases, uh, as shown here on the y-axis. And then the recording persists over time. In this case, we're looking at a 48-hour recording. Every time the animal voids, we see that void land up on the scale where we can weigh it. Um, if we look over here in the right lower right so part of the slide, uh, this is a close-up view of the mechanical separator that we've designed. And it's a fine wire screen type of a device. And you can see that it's designed such that the fecal pellets from the mouse remain trapped while all the drops of urine pass freely and land on our, our pan, which is then weighed on the scale and we can accurately measure each void event. Um, you can see that by looking at the micturogram that there is evaporative loss that occurs, but the uh, measurement of voided urine volume can be taken so quickly that it, any evaporative loss does not interfere with the measure of voided urine volumes. So I want to now turn over to uh, Dr. Nathan Taikaki. Um, Andy has already done a really nice job of giving an overview of, of Nathan's scientific background, uh, but I just want to say um, I'm real happy to have Nathan here with us today. I've really enjoyed having Nathan as a colleague over the last several years. It's a lot of fun working with Nathan um, on various projects, most recently on the development of our Eurovoid system for mice. Uh, Nathan's been using this Eurovoid system in his lab at the University of Vermont for several months now where he's studying how changes in blood flow affect micturition under normal and pathological conditions, such as in type 2 diabetes. So Nathan, thank you so much for being with us today and for speaking us about your work with the Eurovoid system. Oh, you're very welcome, Jerry. It's been a pleasure with working with you as, as well. And uh, it's really been a lot of fun, too, uh, starting this new, uh, this new sort of setup to start something from the ground up. So I really appreciate it, and uh, thanks for letting me be here today. All right, so um, everybody see my screen all right? Uh, with just a little overview of what we're going to cover today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, bladder function testing, um, both in terms of invasive and non-invasive sorts of measurements, and what we can learn from these experiments, uh, and what we can't, and the pros and cons of uh, current techniques that we're using to kind of measure uh, bladder function testing as a whole. And then I'll talk about uh, some of the complex experiments that uh, I've designed uh, to measure voiding behavior and knock out mice, which is, uh, as many of us know, has become a gold standard in understanding uh, physiology as a whole, but require uh, some really careful design and controls to actually uh, uh, garner uh, the really valid information from the experimentation. Uh, next, I'll show you some sample data uh, from some experiments with, uh, with inducible knockout mice uh, from my lab. Uh, talk to you a little bit about the protocols uh, that, uh, that I follow, and then uh, some other applications uh, in terms of how we can use uh, the Eurovoid in the lab. And then lastly, uh, I'll talk to you about some of the best practices that I've come up with. Um, so if you decide to go forward and never use this sort of technology, uh, it can save you some time and, uh, you know, don't do what I did uh, to get started and give you the real, uh, to get some of the best data quickly. So, uh, in terms of bladder function testing, we can really divide it into two major groups, uh, invasive measures and non-invasive measures. And the invasive measure that is, of course, the gold standard uh, that is also a clinical tool for measuring bladder function in humans, of course, is, is cystometry. And Jerry spoke to some of this earlier about their uh, rodent systometry uh, setup. And what we can get from this, uh, from this invasive measure is, of course, void volume, inter inter intermictorition interval, uh, non-voiding contractions, and so on, uh, the standard things we use to measure um, bladder function. Um, one of the drawbacks to me is that, you know, we talk about intermictorition interval and void volume, but it's not 
really um, physiological in that sense. It's, of course, infused saline at a rate that's far greater than urine would normally come in um, from, the, from the kidneys. Uh, so uh, that's why I've become really interested in looking at uh, a measure of voiding behavior, and that's where we have two different non-invasive measures. So the traditional void spot assay, um, which measures void volume and, of course, void occurrence, and then the Eurovoid system, which is what we're all really here to hear about, where you get uh, not only void volume uh, and occurrence, we can actually get a measure of frequency, uh, intermediation, interval, fluid intake over time, and the uh, last thing we'll talk about it, that the software is capable of doing is a pretty neat measure called urine production rate, which I, I find to be something that's, that's come rather useful from, from working with the system. So uh, to begin with, to talk a little bit about the, the uh, first non-invasive technique, uh, the void spot assay. And basically it just revolves around letting rodents urinate on filter paper for a couple of hours uh, because urine fluoresces uh, after it's been exposed to UV light. Um, and the spot area, uh, location, and quantity can be determined in several imaging packages uh, from Image Shaper One. And this is really kind of what you see over here. And, you know, animals, the rodents tend to urinate in the corners under normal voiding behavior, uh, which is here in panel C. And uh, you see in panel D, the stuff in the middle uh, is less likely to be normal voiding behavior, more likely some sort of dysfunction. Uh, down here in panel E, uh, in this, uh, uh, this uh, article, uh, we see that there is uh, a linear relationship between the area of the void spot and the volume. Uh, so you can kind of back calculate uh, in that aspect of how much is in a given volume. Uh, but uh, it gets a little more complicated because uh, you could easily, as you can see here, uh, have overlap in these primary voids. So it's, it's only relative if you get a relatively clean area, but as far as getting any measure of frequency, it just really can't be done. So the pros of this void spot assay you know, are the fact that it's non-invasive and all things aside, relatively inexpensive. Um, it's uh, unimpeded voiding behavior, so there's no catheter to worry about, no surgery, nor any uh, sort of inflammation or stress that could be associated with surgical uh, uh, interventions. It's also repeatable in the same animal at multiple time points. So if you're looking to do something, pardon me, if you're looking to do something uh, uh, over a time course of aging or uh, some of the other uh, type 2 diabetes progression like I look at, uh, it would actually be very useful. Uh, the cons are it's, it, you know, it's, it's really a semi-quantitative measure of void volume because it's very difficult to discern one void from another uh, over time unless you were changing the filter paper every few minutes and that's too, uh, too much of an inter intervention. Um, this means that the void frequency is pretty difficult to interpret or uh, figure out at all. And that leads to some false negatives and sometimes false positives in terms of urine spot overlap, feces, and uh, you keep the time short because the animals tend to eat the paper. So sooner or later, uh, all of your hard work just uh, goes right back in the animal and out the other end. Um, and so to, for me, uh, in the two to six hour window is also a pretty short duration. Uh, I would really like to get at least a complete uh, cycle of an animal's uh, wake uh, sleep cycle to know what's going on with their voiding behavior. So uh, in that aspect, now we can talk about the next one and enter the Eurovoid system. And as Jerry uh, talked about, it's kind of a hybrid in my mind of a spot assay and a metabolic cage. Um, uh, we allow the, uh, in my lab, we allow the rodents to urinate on the scale for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, my institutional care and use committee uh, approved us for 48 hours, uh, maybe longer. It all just depends on uh, your individual university and the animal's tolerance to the grid rod floor, but I, uh, they seem to be doing pretty fine. Uh, you can also measure the food and water mass before and after the experiment to get an idea of food intake and water intake. And then the outputs are, uh, as I said, void frequency, void volume, urine production rate, and all of it is uh, calculated through the included analysis software. And in this one, unlike using area as a measure of void volume, uh, we're looking at mass as a measure of void volume. So now I'd like to move on to talk about some of the experimental design in terms of knockout mice. And um, for me, uh, to, the tamoxifen inducible knockout mice are, are really an indispensable tool for exploring basic physiology, especially in terms of ion channel function, uh, since 
uh, many of the pharmacological agents that uh, are used to uh, inhibit or activate different ion channels um, are not terribly selective. You know, we always say it's uh, the, the age of a drug is inversely proportional to its selectivity, so we find out later that these drugs do many, many other things. Um, and the, the inducible design is, is far superior since the, uh, a lot of the issues with germline knockout of compensation of other channels and so on are, can, be, uh, can be avoided by uh, inducing it. And also we can get a measure of uh, functionality in the animal prior uh, to the you know, treatment with tamoxifen. But with all of these, proper control experiments are really key to their power, uh, to know uh, quite, uh, it, it's quite a complicated layout if you really think about what you really need to test, uh, both in terms of the background strain, the, uh, the animals expressing both the Cree and the flocks gene of interest, and as well as just the flocks mice, uh, to really have controls so we know that this isn't just uh, a response due to uh, the changes in genetics that we've done. And this, that, to that end, it gets really tricky to measure regarding voiding behavior. And so this is the basic experimental design that we use. Um, you know, so here we would see these guys in white are our background strain. In the case of the experiments I'll share with you today, these are C57 black six mice. Uh, then these would be our uh, Cree expressing and flocks knockouts. We'll call these knockout mice. And then these, the gray ones, are just the flocks mice. And so we have uh, the need to see what the voiding behavior is normally prior to anything. Then uh, during the intervention of either vehicle or tamoxifen in each group, and then again after, and be able to intercompare with one another. And that gives us time controls, the vehicle and drug controls, all the proper genetic controls, and age controls. But if you see this picture, you understand why this is a mess. So this is for essentially a single, more or less a single data point. We have you know, 18 animals uh, that goes into it. So with that sort of investment, um, you really want to try to maximize uh, what you get out. And in terms of voiding behavior, the biggest problem, and we all know it, is really voiding varies an awful lot. Uh, animal to animal, vendor to vendor, uh, age to age, and being able to control for that, uh, it gets very difficult. And there's, there's several solutions that we've all used. Um, you can try to get multiple measures for the same animal, uh, which would be ideal. Uh, it's, it's nearly impossible to do with uh, any sort of catheter implantation due to the durations that we're talking about. Uh, so that end, you either do that or you get lots and lots of animals per group, which gets cost prohibitive in a hurry. Uh, second of all, we really want to maximize the data collected from each animal. So as many different parameters as we can, so we don't have to go back and do it again. And to, we also were able to minimize the loss post-surgery by uh, avoiding surgical uh, interventions, since even uh, the best uh, systometry surgeon still has uh, a few that, that don't make it. And when using these knockout mice, especially that are expensive in and of themselves, maintaining the tissue viability for further exploration uh, would be key. We won't have to repeat these uh, experiments time and time again to be able to use the same uh, tissues from the same animals allows, really increases the power of our experimentation. So here's where I find the limitations with the other methods in terms of the invasive and non-invasive measures. Um, with inducible knockout animal cystometry can be relatively difficult to do in the same animal pre and post tamoxifen. Uh, in my lab we found uh, with these animals that we'll talk about today, the most effective means of inducing gene knockout was using uh, an implantable pellet of uh, 10 mg per keg uh, between the shoulder blades as time released over 21 days. Uh, it just wouldn't be feasible to do uh, a catheter implantation for, uh, for conscious uh, cystometry before that, then three weeks of after, and then you know, three weeks after that so we can get full knockout of the protein. That's just entirely too long due to risk of infection over time. Um, and it also complicates any uh, complementary experiments we want to do afterwards, uh, like isometric force reportings from the bladder, due to the fact that you would have had that catheter in there uh, for you know weeks, uh, you know, with fibrosis and some remodeling. That is also problematic at actually understanding how the bladder is actually working. And lastly, it gets to be cost prohibitive. Maintaining a surgical suite and performing surgery on that many animals, as well as uh, post-surgical care, it, it gets to be extremely expensive. 
In terms of the void spot assay, it does work to some extent, except the duration is a little bit short, around you know two to six hours, roughly four hours. And it's really an incomplete measurement of voiding function. The best you're able to do is get a, a solid guess at location of void and a relative volume, um, but not to really understand uh, much more about the urine voiding behavior other than that. There's also safety concerns with tamoxifen, uh, specifically as an estrogen receptor modulator in urine. Uh, in the case of the filter paper, you have to handle uh, that filter paper and scan it uh, to get these pictures to be able to figure out uh, where the voids are and how, how big. And uh, that's not necessarily a safe thing to do in terms of a drug that's a, a, a common cancer care chemotherapeutic. It's not terribly good to be exposed to. Uh, and lastly, reproducibility can be a bit of a problem. Like I said, they tend to chew up the filter paper uh, and so on. So you may lose uh, valuable data uh, just uh, based on the mouse's behavior. So, you know, in a perfect world, this is what we would have. Uh, we would have a system that we could do long-term measurements of voiding function and be able to take these measurements before, during, uh, and after vehicle or drug administration, be it tamoxifen or whatever. Um, and that these results would be reproducible uh, and objective measures of void volume, frequency, and behavior, and be able to extrapolate those three things independent of one another. Most importantly, to be non-invasive uh, with relatively simple data to analyze uh, to minimize the amount of time that it takes to put it together. And then lastly, to, uh, and it goes with this non-invasive nature, is to be complementary uh, to other experiments to be done after voiding uh, behavior and be allowed to do so. And, you know, I say in a perfect world, it's, uh, I guess we're in a perfect world because I really think that the Eurovoid is a tool that allows us to do all of these things. And we've been really excited to have a chance to, to use it. <clears throat> so the big question, what do the data look like? Uh, as you can see here on the right, this is uh, some of what uh, the data look like. I think this is uh, a, a rat with uh, uh, cyclophosphamide induced uh, cystitis that you can see here all the multiple voids um, and I'll show you a lot more about the traces and so on in a minute and so what I'm going to show you today are some unpublished findings from my lab um, uh, using a tamoxifen inducible ion channel knockout mouse um, as I said I delivered tamoxifen tw uh, for 21 days in the time release pellet at 10 mg per kg that's uh, implanted beneath uh, you know beneath subcutaneously in the, you know, between the shoulder blades and I was able to take measurements uh, at three time points or ages, if you will, uh, in these animals. The first was at four weeks, which was pre-pellet implantation. Uh, we wanted to get an idea of what their uh, void behavior was early, since this is pretty young. Um, then at six weeks, we implanted the pellet, and I waited two more weeks uh, and did a, a measure of voiding behavior during tamoxifen delivery. And I did this for the sake of understanding if tamoxifen in and of itself is affecting voiding behavior in some way. Um, so there are several reports that even in male mice, estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen can uh, affect voiding behavior. So it was important to know uh, if something was happening uh, just because of tamoxifen. And then lastly, uh, I measured them at, at 14 weeks, which would be roughly five weeks post uh, completion of the tamoxifen uh, elution pellet. And uh, in our prior experience, plenty of time for the knockout of the gene of interest and then protein turnover to actually get rid of uh, the ion channel. So what I'm showing you here is really the first test uh, that we ever did. This was uh, animals that I put in the Eurovoid the, really the day that Jerry brought the Eurovoid down to show us and talk about it. Uh, I had these two animals for another experiment and I figured let's take a look. So these are 16 weeks uh, of age, these animals. So this is at the final time point. And at the top, you see uh, what would be a sham animal. So this uh, animal went, underwent the pellet implantation surgery, but, uh, but uh, just no pellet. And then at the bottom uh, was the same knockout animal that actually received the tamoxifen pellet. And this is, uh, they got that eight weeks prior to this recording. What you can see in the top is a relatively normal micturogram, which I actually think it's the same one you saw earlier on some of the marketing pieces Jerry showed, but we have, uh, you know, here you see the few micturitions. You can also get an idea of the day-light cycle. You can see I kind of snuck these guys in at the tail end of their sleep uh, cycle, and then where they're awake and asleep again and awake. And if you look down here, uh, it, 
this is a, a pretty digital response. You can definitely see the increase in micturitions uh, over time. Many more, you can see this sort of a dribbly response here. Um, far more micturitions are indicative in my mind of an overactive phenotype in these animals. So um, now the important thing was to do is to look at what happens, uh, you know, if this difference that we see here is actually due to tamoxifen or if this is simply two animals, different level of stress, different, you know, parents, and that's just how these mice were. Uh, that was just their normal voiding behavior, and there's actually no difference. So then went forward in, in, in another cohort. This is what we looked at at four weeks of age prior to sham uh, on the top uh, or pellet implantation on the bottom, and that'll be that way through the rest of the slides. And you can see at four weeks of age, one, these animals are pretty small, uh, but two, their voiding behavior is very different than uh, at least I expected or had seen in adult mice. They void far more often uh, in smaller volumes. Uh, this kind of makes sense. They're young and small uh, and still undergoing some degree of, uh, of, of development. And so um, it was not uncommon at all to see micturition patterns of this uh, frequency. But then if we go to 14 weeks of age, so at the very end then, um, I'll show you in the, in the uh, end results what the data look like, a, a, including the tamoxifen treatment time. But we see that the, the phenotype that I'm getting, and these are actually the exact same two animals in this slide, that uh, indeed the sham animal has grown uh, and, and micturates far less often uh, in a given day, you know, basically three times a day in this example. However, the animal receiving tamoxifen is, has, if anything, gone up in, in micturition frequency. And you can see these intervals are pretty short and, again, a uh, pretty huge increase, uh, suggesting that uh, the animals, act, this knockout of the science channel, actually did indeed uh, lead to bladder dysfunction in these mice. Great. Well, uh, I also agreed with many of you, and water intake was definitely something I was uh, curious about. Uh, because I really wanted to make sure uh, that the, any changes we saw in voiding uh, aren't just due to drinking a whole lot more water. Um, and so, you know, I just, as I said, I did it in a, in a simple manner, just weighed the water bottles before and after the experiment. And it appears the water intake uh, was relatively constant over time, although it does appear that there was, uh, could be a small increase in water intake during tamoxifen treatment. Uh, and that will become important here as I show you the rest of the data. Uh, but in the end, uh, the increase returned more or less to the sham level. So water intake stayed relatively constant, and uh, which was uh, good to know. Um, first measure here is in void frequency. And uh, I looked at it in voids per day. And I should have said this before, but this is why I chose 48 hours, uh, is I really wanted to, one, uh, be able to get a full, uh, full time course of the animal, but also uh, to see if there's any habituation uh, to being in the cage and see if void frequency changed day to day. And, and truthfully, it, it didn't appear to. Um, mostly the two days were pretty similar. So anyway, uh, in the voids per day, uh, in the sham animals, uh, we, in these knockouts, we really saw a steady decrease with age uh, in terms of void frequency, which is exactly what you'd expect as the animals got bigger and their bladders got bigger uh, and they were more fully developed, they voided less often. Um, tamoxifen treatment itself, seem to increase void frequency. I think that may correlate, as I showed earlier, with the increase in water intake, perhaps. Um, but as time went on, that, uh, that increase in void frequency in tamoxifen-treated knockout animals never quite returned to the sham level. As a matter of fact, it's almost double uh, at 13 weeks after tamoxifen treatment. <clears throat> So this, again, uh, shows some pretty solid evidence of this being an uh, overactive phenotype in these animals. So next we're looking at the void volume, I guess, is, as you can see on the, the y-axis here, in terms of mass. Uh, so this is directly off of the scale. And I, I did that because, obviously, the, the volume correction to weight uh, assumes you know, uh, ultra-pure water. So I'm showing it as mass because, obviously, the, there's other things in the urine. Um, so the average void volume in the shams steadily increases, which perfectly, again, lines up with the idea of the void frequency decreasing. Um, and this increased volume is much less pronounced in the tamoxifen-treated 
mice. Uh, you can see it's, um, it's not nearly at the same rate of increase uh, here. Uh, again, suggested of uh, what we were thinking about the phenotype of these animals with this ion channel knocked out. Uh, then, you know, we can look at the intermictorition interval. And like I said earlier, in terms of uh, systometry, uh, I think this is a little truer indication of the intermictorition interval since it's actually related to urine production rate uh, in that specific animal. And as you can see in the sham mice, we get a steady increase with age. Again, all of these factors are lining up uh, to see, you know, the decrease in uh, the increase in void volume, decrease in frequency, and thus an increase in intermictorition interval. And tamoxifen treatment itself seemed to reduce the intermictorition interval, which again lines up with the idea of increasing the frequency. Uh, but this decrease never, uh, again, well, returned to the sham levels. Again, it stayed decreased uh, in these animals. And so the last measure that I, I thought was kind of neat, and uh, I, it, unfortunately is probably the measure of the highest variability between animals, but it was a great check, especially for future experiments with diabetic uh, animals. And that's the urine production rate. And the software calculates this as the amount of time per duration since the last void. So you know, void number one, a few minutes, and void number two. So it looks at the uh, amount voided in void number two and divided by the amount of time since void number one. Um, and so uh, I say it's the highest variability. So I really started to look at these at relative differences between the sham and tamoxifen treated mice uh, over time. Because as you can see, even at four weeks, there's a pretty reasonable difference between the sham and tamoxifen treated animals. This is, these are essentially, they're all cage mates. This is before anybody's received tamoxifen or anything. So I was just looking at the relative change. And it, it appears for the most part that the relative change between the two uh, stays pretty constant, including during tamoxifen. Uh, maybe the urine production rate drops a little bit uh, after tamoxifen, which would be interesting for a number of reasons of my own research, but it could be the case. Um, but the reason I like this with terms of the diabetic studies is because um, in these animals, it suggests that kidney function is, is not changed. And you know, one of the big questions always with measuring uh, avoiding behavior in a diabetic animal is, is it an overactive bladder or is it just an increase in uh, diuresis and naturesis that's resulting in an increase in urine production and increase in voiding and it's totally normal. Uh, so uh, the bladder itself, it, that is to say, is totally normal. And this it would be a great measure to be able to know. And I would expect then if, if that had been a situation where uh, diuresis has gone up, we would, we would see an increase in this urine production rate. So that's the the last measure there that I could take from it. And I think that this is really giving us an awful lot of, of information um, in, a, in, a, in a relatively easy sort of way. So for uh, me and for these animals, you know, what's next? Uh, what came next after these experiments? Well, uh, easily could have done systometry following these now that they're knocked out uh, to see if, uh, if there were changes in the micturition uh, patterns that you would see in terms of non-voiding contractions and whatnot. Um, part of me says to go to systometry uh, simply because there's very little, uh, or there's no data really published uh, about a system like the Eurovoid uh, to compare to, to know how uh, the voiding behavior compares to systometry versus the Eurovoid system. Uh, the other things that we've done is, you know, histology to look at bladder wall remodeling, uh, molecular biology, so you know, it's always important to confirm the protein's actually missing, from the, the tissue of interest, so we can do that. Uh, we've also done isometric force recordings of bladder strips. Um, a, a technique we use an awful lot in the lab is, is ex vivo afferent nerve recordings, so taking the bladder and attached nerves out and recording afferent activity as the bladder is filled ex vivo. And because we had no surgical intervention to these animals, that's a very uh, simple thing to do. And frankly, uh, the world's your oyster. Pretty much any additional techniques you would like to explore uh, for whatever your scientific question at hand is uh, can be done now with, uh, with having this non-invasive sort of system. It's giving you some really powerful data out uh, relatively easily with little uh, subjectivity to it whatsoever. Uh, so in terms of the best practices, um, training doesn't appear to be necessary. Uh, unlike, uh, so any of you who have measured blood pressure with a tail cuff know that you have to train for a certain amount of days to habituate the animal to it to actually get a valid and reproducible sort of uh, 
of blood pressure measurements. That doesn't appear to be necessary or uh, of an effect uh, in this system. Uh, they appear to tolerate the grid rod floor pretty well. Uh, I usually put their little huts, their little enrichment huts in there with them and uh, have seen again with those in there no problem whatsoever in terms of interference with voiding uh, or a change in the output. Um, proper cleaning between the experiments is an absolute imperative um, since stress of any social sort has uh, been shown to uh, markedly alter voiding behavior in terms of uh, causing overactivity. Um, we want to make sure that they aren't smelling the last guy that was in there uh, when, when you're doing these experiments. And I also find that uh, cage mates work best. I, we have two of these zero void systems. Uh, I would like about four more, but uh, we'll see how that goes someday. Um, but having cage mates works really great because they can still see and smell each other, uh, and it really gets a better picture of what their voiding behavior would be like normally. Uh, of course, this really must be in a quiet uh, climate control place for the entire duration, and uh, I suggest making sure that whatever room you choose uh, is uh, you, know, you can even leave a recording device in there just to make sure that something strange doesn't kick on at, at 2 o'clock in the morning because um, I, I found, as I show here on the right, that the little things count, that uh, those little noises can make all the difference. Uh, it's a, you really need a quiet humidifier uh, and lighting controls. And I, I bring this up because when um, – actually, I should, there were two animals I did before the first set that I showed you. Um, that uh, their voiding behaviors were totally identical and uh, rhythmic that had nothing to do with the daylight cycle and I thought the whole thing was broken and it was getting bleed over between the channels and something was wrong and it turns out I had the humidifier set on high and it was kind of old and it made this huge <laughs> sound every time it fired up and so what I was seeing in the traces were the two uh, mice getting startled uh, and urinating in response uh, so as soon as I turned that down and put it a nice quiet setting, uh, everything uh, worked fine and it was able to get a good picture of voiding behavior. Uh, it's also important to remember to turn off the monitor and prevent the computer from going to sleep uh, or screensaver uh, just so you, you don't have that light bleed over from the monitor uh, into the room to uh, uh, actually alter the daylight cycle in some way, unless the room that they're normally in has a computer monitor on and then, uh, then you'd be fine. Uh, and lastly, and this one uh, was, for me, the second most important, I guess, is to get a uh, uh, power supply backup, so UPS battery-powered backup for the computer. Because I uh, am in a relatively old building whose power can be relatively intermittent. And uh, there are several days of data that I have lost uh, in the course of these experiments simply because uh, the power went out in the middle of the night. And, you know, in recording for 48 hours, you know, the, once the computer shuts off, it shuts off. It can't turn back on without me doing it. And I uh, had, of course, uh, no idea. So if we had that power supply backup, I would have maintained uh, power to it and uh, been able to keep my data. So that's just the last recommendation. And, you know, that's really uh, all I have in terms of, of using this system that's been uh, really revolutionized what I've been looking at. And... Uh, allowed me to do some things that uh, I never thought would be able to do simply and quickly in the way that it's been. Um, and so I thank Jerry and the team at uh, Met Associates for uh, including us on this project. Yes, let's move into the Q&A now. Uh, so first question, Nathan, uh, what uses do you see for this system beyond voiding behavior in genetically modified animals? Uh, for instance, and uh, Peter Yun has maybe alluded to this, uh, asking about uh, being interested in looking at the conductivity of urine. But you know, can the urine be analyzed for biochemical biochemical analysis? Uh, no, those are two great questions. Um, it, it, so I'll I'll fill the second one first. Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, so as you can see from the graphs, uh, the rapid decline in volume is is the in and mass rather is is evaporation. So you know, in a 48-hour time period, you know, there's no great way to collect the urine uh, in a way that would be useful for analysis afterwards, um, at least that I can think of uh, without disturbing the system. I mean, Jerry, do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I can. Uh, it is something that we're, 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 we are, we do have kind of on the radar to work towards because um, uh, we do think it, we have, uh, uh, to be able to do uh, further analysis on the urine itself would be a benefit for uh, 
uh, you could do drug pharmacokinetics or uh, just uh, other biochemical analyses on the urine. So it's something we want to see if we can work out. But really, our main objective here was to have a, a way of accurately tracking the void volume. So the the collection device, if you will, is a is a large wide pan that really collects all the urine that's voided out, even when the animals are at the corner of the cage, as you saw in the filter spots where they tend to void right around the, the edges of the cage. A lot of that urine ends up spraying out past the sides of the cage. Well, our pan is going to collect all of that, even the sprays that from the edge of the cage. So again, we kind of have to make a trade-off there with uh, losing over time due to evaporation. But it's something we will continue to keep on, our, in, in, on the radar of working out a, a collecting system that will still allow for further uh, analysis of the urine. Perfect. Yeah, and then to the, into the second question about other uses. Um, I've been so happy with this system that our, we've, we've been seriously debating and probably will put every single animal that we're going to use for any sort of bladder experimentation in the Eurovoid for a day or two prior to using it, just uh, to know what their baseline voiding behavior is. Um, you know, you think about it, we just assume that they all micturate in the same way, and they probably don't. Um, and to be able to then find out for every animal, for every sort of experiment that we've done, to understand what their baseline voiding behavior was uh, could be really useful. So uh, that's why uh, I, I, that's why I'm looking for a lot more of these things because uh, this really would be a good tool. No, that's great feedback, guys. Uh, any additional thoughts, Jerry, on future system use uh, or, or uh, you know, going beyond just the voiding behavior and uh, just to yeah, I think we're real interested to hear what our uh, the audience has to say too. And if any, if you put any comments in on the poll question about what other measures you're looking for, we're we're definitely looking at doing things like adding uh, weighing system to the food hopper and the water bottle so that you can track food and water intake over time in an automated fashion. Uh, any other measures that people are looking for, we're interested to get feedback on so that we can continue to develop the system into a, a useful research tool. Perfect. Very good. Um, okay, another question. Uh, this, uh, Jerry, uh, this one's for you. What is the smallest volume of urine that can be detected from a mouse? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the So... The scale that we use it has readability down to one milligram. So the scale itself can resolve milligram uh, masses. And it's really a, the, the ambient conditions of the lab uh, will come into play. So if you're in a stable environment that has very few mechanical vibrations and, and the signal on the scale remains very flat uh, with nothing happening, uh, you can resolve very low urine volumes. Uh, our analysis software allows the user to set a threshold. Um, and, and so for mice, I find that a threshold of like 15 milligrams uh, uh, is a good threshold to discriminate voids from ambient noise. So, it, 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 but that is a parameter that the user has control over. You can adjust the minimum void volume based on your, your, your situation. Um, I think a, a general rule of thumb that I found useful is 15 milligrams. Okay, that's perfect. Um, also kind of looking at uh, system capabilities, uh, I, can you clarify, can more than one animal be put in the cage at one time and then also touch on how one might configure this type of system for high throughput data collection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as far as the more than one animal per cage, uh, you really wouldn't want to do that. You want to limit it to one animal per cage. That way you know that the voided urine uh, is coming from that animal uh, because you wouldn't be able to determine if the voids are coming from which animal if you had more than one in there. So, But for throughput purposes, um, as we mentioned earlier, the recording computer can, can, can communicate with up to 12 systems uh, simultaneously. Um, and the current configuration has the Eurovoid system on a benchtop kind of a platform. Uh, and but we are we are working on a scalable system that will allow you to com connect these in a modular fashion, so that you could have them in a rack type of a configuration with even like casters on the bottom that will allow you to move it around the lab. You could cart it into the room 
uh, for an experiment and when you're done with that cohort of animals, cart it into a storage room, cart it back out when it's being used. So those are some of the scaling up uh, things that we're working on to make it uh, even more uh, suitable for high throughput. Okay, that's great feedback. Um, thank you very much, Jerry. Georgie Petkoff has asked um, if the system could be used in larger guinea pigs. And we've also had some interest through the registration form questions coming in about using this system, um, not in a mouse, but in rats. Uh, we have prepared uh, some additional slide content uh, to share. So I'm going to advance to that now. And Jerry, maybe could you take the lead on talking a little bit about um, uh, how a rat setup compares to the mouse you're avoid? And then just maybe touch on Georgie's uh, quest about, you know, maybe uh, having it suitable for uh, or used with larger guinea pigs. Yeah, sure. Be happy to. Thanks for the question, Georgie. That's a really good question. Um, for uh, larger rodents, rats and guinea pigs, for example, we would then switch over from the type of cage that we showed you with mice to a traditional metabolic cage. Uh, we have uh, uh, we we we've settled on using the Technoplast metabolic cages. They do a really good job of separating feces and urine, um, and we have these uh, type of metabolic cage systems for rats uh, less than 300 grams body weight, and then rats that are 300 grams and, and above. And the same type of cage could be used for a guinea pig uh, to do avoiding behavior in guinea pigs. And guinea pigs, that's a really good model for bladder physiology because. Uh, Guinea pigs have long been used for cellular uh, muscle physiology studies, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of information known on 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 cellular phenomenon in the bladder in guinea pigs. So the the this type of a metabolic cage system would work really well in that scenario. Um, in the in the in the in this situation, the urine is actually collected in a flask that sort of looks like an Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, it's got a narrow neck and a wide base, and the neck actually flares out into a funnel which maximizes the urine collection. And, and in this case, you get very little urine evaporation because the, the flask itself uh, minimizes uh, evaporative loss. Um, and if, if you could advance to the next slide, Andy, this is a, uh, a recording uh, of a micturogram from a rat in a urovoid system. And you can see the very stable recording pattern, uh, the very stable voiding pattern that is seen, you know, virtually no evaporative loss. Um, this is over a 24 hour period. Uh, this is a normal Wistar female rat, um, and you can see very nice circadian patterns as well. Um, the animal was put in at the start of the light cycle, and then the dark cycle started at 12 hours. So you can see low, relatively low voiding frequency during the, the light hours when the animal is fairly inactive, and then in the dark when the animal wakes up and starts being active, more frequent, smaller volume voids, very clear, uh, clearly apparent in the rat. So uh, the system does work well uh, with rats uh, and, 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 and for guinea pigs as well, with larger rodents. So thanks for the question.